All right, we got a pretty good crew coming in tonight. That's a good thing. Um, and the meeting is being recorded, so that's a good thing, too. Well, yeah, there. Are you there, Aid? Is that you? Hello, Aid. Is that you? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, you wasn't muddied. I got it. Um, well, you've totally blown my train of thought. Uh, we did the town hall meeting last month where we were asking for suggestions of things the club should be working on. The suggestion list hits pretty close to what we were doing anyway, but I kept throwing the blurb in during the meeting. And it's being recorded. If you listen to it after the fact, there's a link on the web page where you can email. And I'll be honest, I have gotten zero emails on that. So I don't know if that means everything we covered in the meeting um, was nobody had any other ideas or if, if nobody listened to the recording. Don't know which, but that's not important. We, we got a good presentation tonight. We're going to do something a little bit different. Um, normally, I like to get the club business out of the way first and then do the presentation, but we're going to do the presentation first, uh, the fox hunting. And Joe, I saw you and your wife do the uh, the POTA thing a couple years ago in Huntsville. Yeah. I, 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 was, I was really entertained. Um, having done POTA a few times with my friend Casey for ZUA and, and got him involved, I was dragging him out into it. So you didn't really present anything there that was new to me. I think it was new to him because uh, he had just started with it. But it was it was a lot of fun. And you you guys really know how to put on a show. I'll I'll give you that. We have uh, fun. Okay, so after after the meeting, after Joe is all finished up here, Val needs to talk about something for a few minutes. And uh, can we get the who who changed the put the agenda back up? Whoever just changed it. So I was going to hit that real quick before we move on. John, are you driving it? Okay, so Friday tomorrow's lunch at the Mexican restaurant on Buford Highway. If you haven't been, come on out. The food is pretty good. The service is pretty quick. Uh, the guy who waits on our table basically speaks pretty good English. You just have to say things two or three times. And uh, we're, we're also thinking that we may be in the process of outgrowing their dining room. So there may be a discussion tomorrow if anybody has any ideas of places in the area. Uh, you see, the next thing is, and John, thanks for putting this together. I never think about it. Uh, you see, we have the uh, ARC, the, the VE testing is this week. Um, and at the airport, y'all know where that is in the Angel Flight Room upstairs. It's the same room where we're going to start having the second Sunday technical sessions again, but that's going to be in March. And there is a posting on the website or on the on the on the there is a posting on the website about that session. It's an antenna build session. And I'll put a blurb out on, on groups.io a few times leading up to that. Uh, Dalton Ham Fest, it's worth the drive up there, if nothing else, to go over to the Western Sizzling and eat lunch. Um, every year, it seems it's it's sort of up and down. Some years it's ice cold, some years it's warm, some years it's big, some years it's wet. It's certainly worth the hour and a half, two-hour drive up there. So keep that in mind. And well, yes, sir. I uh, just wanted the uh, VE testing session doesn't start at 1230. So what time does it start? Noon. The, the sheet here says 1230. Oh, I know it's over at two, right? Yes. Well, it's over when the last person finishes. So what time does it start? 12? Yeah, 12. Okay. Okay. So y'all see there's a correction on the sheet. No big deal. Get there at 1230. You still got time. Um, okay, that's it. Rob, why don't you why don't you take over, introduce our speaker, do whatever you're going to do, and uh, when when you all finish, we'll handle the club business and go for it. Oh my God, there's Larry. <laughs> all right, you got it, Rob. Rob, you're muted. Okay. The, the reason we have a lot of people is because of Joe Domaleski, our speaker. He's, he is, as he, as Bill said, a um, great speaker, and he's very entertaining. And here's here's a picture of him and his lovely wife, who uh, who may be on tonight, right, Joe? They, 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 I, I don't know. I think she might be on the phone with uh, one of our adult children. So, uh, <laughs> but you, you got you got me, the lesser half. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that you were on the, uh, you guys were on the cover of CQ magazine. We published that one on the on the website. And uh, yeah, you're with the the Fayetteville Club, Fayette County Club, and Joe does all kinds of things. This is just one of the things that he does. And because uh, I think in the fall we spoke, and he said, "What do you want me to present on?" And I think he gave me four or five choices. <laughs> so so uh, here we are with uh, fox hunting, which I think is very, very interesting. You know, it takes skill, it takes luck. Um, it's a nice activity. So with that said, let me turn it over to KI4, ASK, Joe Domaleski, over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. I, I was scanning the participant list and I think I know about half of you. And if we were all assembled together in the same room, I'd probably ask you guys and gals a few questions like, how long have you been a ham radio operator? Have you done fox hunting? Uh, what's your favorite thing to do? That sort of thing. But uh, we'll just jump right into it since we are all connected virtually. Uh, as, uh, as, as, as Rob said, you know, I have lots of interests in this hobby, like I'm sure all of you do. Um, one of those interests is fox hunting. So uh, I know that a few of you, just by uh, seeing your names in the participant list, some of you have done fox hunts, some of you have put them on, some of you have helped me learn about it, uh, and others are wondering what in the heck are we doing with foxes. Uh, we're doing nothing with foxes. They're actually hidden radio transmitters. I've given this presentation probably about 12 times. Each time it's a little different and each time it gets a little better, I hope. So I was looking through my notes. I think the last time I gave this particular presentation was in Huntsville uh, about two years ago. So uh, uh, we, we really enjoy the hobby and I'm, I'm honored to speak with, uh, with you guys and gals. And, there's actually a connection to the Atlanta Radio Club, which when I get to that slide, we'll see if anybody picks up on that connection. So we really, and I'm going to say we, because I have often presented this, um, given this presentation with my wife, Mary Catherine, on board. And uh, we really think amateur radio just, it sounds better outside. Uh, I like being outside. Having radios with it is just extra fun, and we have fun with it to, uh, together. All right. Let me click the button here. <clears throat> so I'm going to cover just a few basics for those of you that are new to fox hunting at the beginning. And then we're, the real thing I want you to take away from this is there's really just three steps to finding the fox. And if you can just focus on those three things, you'll, you'll have a lot of fun, you'll be effective. I remember when we were learning about fox hunting, wow, seven, eight years ago, we went up to North Atlanta, not Atlanta Radio Club, but uh, North Fulton Amateur Radio League, actually. We had a, a guest presenter about fox hunting, and uh, we drove all the way up from Fayette County. Fayette County, uh, I live about 15 miles south of the Atlanta airport. Um, we're home of the Skywarn uh, repeater network and the Wednesday night um, uh, linked repeater net that the, the hub repeater is, is here in Fayette County. Um, we drove all the way up there to hear a presentation about fox hunting. Great speaker, very intelligent, very technical. And I remember sitting up there after we drove through all the traffic and Mary Catherine leaned over to me and said, I'm not sure what he's even talking about. And I said, well, I'm following about half of it. And then finally he got to the question and answer period and he said, you know, is there any questions? And one guy raised his hand. He said, yeah, this is great information. I still don't know what we're supposed to do to find the fox. So this presentation was actually inspired by that one. This one is going to be decidedly non-technical, and it is really going to focus on the practical. Um, 
And so uh, with that, let's uh, let's go ahead and, and, and dive in. We and, and these pictures are, are pictures from various hunts that I have participated in. You may see yourselves in some of these pictures, maybe not. Um, it's a fun and useful activity. I know I invited some folks from Aries in here. Um, you know, Aries isn't just about supporting the Peachtree Road Race, which I enjoy. Those y'all know I do. I like to run run the race with the radio. Um, it's uh, it's it's not necessarily a contest, although it can be. Um, it I like to tell people that are not hams, it's like a scavenger hunt, but it involves radios, and uh, it requires very simple equipment. I'm going to mention a few pieces of equipment that uh, that we use. Uh, really, all you need is a radio receiver. You don't even need an amateur radio. Uh, a, a simple Handheld scanner radio will uh, will do, and there's really just a few skills needed to do it. So uh, that's a picture. Uh, some of you know John Snell and AI4RT. He's very active in a lot of the. Uh, he lives down here. He's very active in a lot of the land track club events. You know why is it so much fun? You know I think it's great anytime you can be outdoors. Uh, a lot of times you can participate as a team, which is a lot of fun. Again, no special equipment needed. Uh, you can be competitive. And I, boy, I have seen some competitive uh, people out there. Uh, a couple folks on here know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was at one fox hunt recently. And, uh, you know, I, I technically was the first one to find the fox. But um, the other team was very uh, vocal that uh, I, I kind of, there was some luck involved in me finding the fox and they they really insisted on being first so i i yielded i'm the same way on the bands too i, I like to operate qrp and i get stomped on a lot and that's okay i'm i'll i'll, I'll pick up i'm not gonna fight i'll pick up and move on um but for the most part fox hunting you know it it's it's really done at your own pace uh there's some exercise involved in it uh, which I think is good. I think it's good to get out and stretch your legs, but it's not a it's not a five mile road march typically. And there's some mental exercise involved in this. Uh, just thinking through, taking bearings, plots, uh, and we're going to talk about some of those things uh, this evening. Now, besides the fun part of it, Sorry, can, I, can I get in here for a second? Just yeah. I was when you get a chance, you might want to go back to the beginning and and tell everybody the people who've never seen fox hunting you know, what, what it is. We've been talking about why it's fun and, and, and all that, but I don't know. Yeah, we're getting to that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, we've established that it's fun. It's also an important skill, uh, search and rescue, um, you know, wildlife beacons, distress signals, um, crash sites. I know, uh, Civil Air Patrol does this. Locating interference uh, could be jammers. Uh, you guys have uh, one of the widest area coverage repeaters up there on the Nation's Bank Tower. We have one too that 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 really covers uh, South Atlanta. And every once in a while, we'll get somebody on there with a bow fang and not licensed. And um, you know, this kind of skill can help identify where those hidden radio signals are coming from. More often than not, we had one recently. Uh, it, it was a ham. He was a good, good, good friend of the club. He had a, he had a stuck transmitter, and it kept keying up. And we, uh, I think he was embarrassed when we, uh, when we found him. So uh, you know, fun and useful. So, getting into the equipment, I guess the first thing to kind of establish. Okay, it's fun. It's useful. What is the fox? The fox is a hidden radio transmitter. Nothing more, nothing less. They come in all shapes and sizes. And the goal of fox hunting is to find that hidden radio transmitter. The sniffer, and not a lot of people call it that, but the sniffer is used to kind of sniff out or detect the fox and so it is a radio receiver so you've got a fox 
that's a hidden radio transmitter. And you've got a sniffer, a radio receiver, that you're using to go locate the fox. The sniffer needs an antenna. There's my wife, Mary Catherine, uh, who is my fox. And she uses that antenna, like any other fox hunter, <coughs> to find the radio signal. Now, typically, and most people think of finding the strong signal, you can actually find the opposite of a strong signal in which you null the signal. The null is kind of the opposite of a, of a radio signal. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then an attenuator. This is probably um, the hardest part of fox hunting. When you do it and you get close to that hidden radio transmitter, oftentimes the signal is too strong and it overloads your radio. So you actually have to decrease the strength of the signal so you can hone in on it. So fox hunting is nothing more than going after and locating a hidden radio transmitter. So just want to show you pictures of some of the various configurations. There is no standard. Uh, typically, we call a daddy fox one that's running a little bit higher power and a baby fox lower power. Um, they might be in an ammo can. They might be in a pelican case. Uh, that one in the middle is a Baofeng radio, and the and the Fox controllers just plugged into it. That's actually one that I own. There's one in a uh, in a in a plastic tube that's camouflaged. There's one in a uh, a, a, a film case. Uh, I've seen them in a potato chip bag. I've uh, I've seen them inside of literally a stuffed fox. So it looks like a fox. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Hmm. And, Joe, Joe yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, are you Are you doing a screen share right now? I'm not seeing anything here. Yes, I am sharing the screen. Is, is it not coming through? I'm not. I don't know what other folks are getting. Yeah, you get, I'm, what you I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. Oh, that's strange. Okay. I'll have to figure my system out then. Okay. Yeah, unless you have another Zoom window that, that it's in. Sometimes. On, on okay, the I'll look on that. Okay. Okay. And just for those of you that are having technical difficulties and not and, and maybe not able to see the the presentation that I'm I'm sharing, I gave Rob a copy of this in PDF format that, that he's going to send out to the club afterwards. So uh, happy for, for you to have uh, you know copies of it. And I'll mention this again at the end. There are clickable links. I've actually made a couple YouTube videos where I go in the field and actually walk you through a fox hunt. And you can click on the links in this presentation. It'll take you right to it. So uh, if, 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 you know, besides Val, if you're not seeing the presentation, uh, just know that, you know, we'll, we'll get a copy of it to you. Okay. So the sniffer or the receiving radio, again, that can come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes depending upon the equipment you have. Uh, what I've got displayed there in the bottom right corner is an ICOM R5 receiver. That's not a transceiver, it's a receiver only. And typically when I do a fox hunt, I prefer to have a receive only radio. Uh, it is very easy to accidentally key up and overload the fox and kind of spoil it for everybody else. And so, uh, but sometimes I'll use my HT. Pictured in the other window there is my uh, tape measure Yagi, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, that's an, uh, a Kenwood uh, D74. But an HT, a scanner... The big thing that you really want to have is a visual signal strength indicator. That'll give you a visual picture of how strong the signal is. Um, I prefer a BNC connector on my radios, and that allows a quick change of various antenna configurations, but it's not required. Uh, I've seen people do fox hunts with no Yagi antenna, just the whip antenna. And we'll talk about attenuation in a minute. And they just take the antenna off to attenuate the signal. So any 
radio that is capable of receiving the frequency that the fox is transmitting on will work. Okay, for some of you Atlanta Radio Club old timers, anybody recognize the gentleman in the lower left helping Mary Catherine? That's Alan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and right above that, um, back when Jim Reed was was president, we came up and you guys did a, a tape measure Yagi build at a at a makerspace and. We came up and made our, and actually Mary Catherine did most of the work, as you can see. She, uh, uh, we made that tape measure Yagi, and that was a lot of fun, and it was fun doing that with your club. And uh, we still have that antenna. In fact, that experience motivated us last year, last March. We actually did a group tape measure Yagi build for our club in Fayette County, in large part inspired by what we did with with you guys. I. I think it was 2018, but I don't remember the year. And uh, and so uh, that Yagi antenna uh, has had some good use. I've used it on satellites. Uh, the nice thing about a Yagi antenna is it is very directional. So a typical whip antenna is omnidirectional. And by directional, that means that we can point it in the direction of the strong signal and really tune into it and, and pull that signal out. It's not required, but it is recommended to have a, a tape measure Yagi specifically, because if you're tromping around in the woods, it's easy to uh, run into brush and those uh, tape measure elements are very flexible. I think your club is actually going to do another uh, antenna build sometime, right? Yeah, we've got one in the works right now for March to get the second Sunday technical session started rolling again. That would be a VHF UHF vertical, basically. Uh, yeah, and uh, and you know, highly recommend folks that are interested in fox hunting sign up for that. And and you know, it's a lot of fun to make it. Um, and again, just a few. I'm not going to go. I told you I was going to make this non technical. Um, high gain in the front, low gain in the back. Uh, it's not necessarily needed. Um, up there in the top left, that's a that's a picture of Ryan Bibby. We're actually working a satellite, but I just want to show what a, a commercially made Yagi looks like. Uh, the three element tape measure Yagi is is really kind of a, a ham radio classic. I think I think every ham ought to have one in their in their toolkit. It's very versatile. Um, an optional piece of equipment that's kind of fun. Uh, this is a picture of us with the uh, West Georgia Amateur Radio Society. They out in Carrollton. They put on some good fox hunts, and uh, the uh, the loop antenna there. Um, you use that to null the signal. So I said the null is kind of the opposite of the strong signal. So if you're really close, sometimes you want to find where there is no signal. And the strength, a lot of people get this confused. The antenna reception is strongest around the circumference of that loop. If the loop is pointed so that the empty spot in the middle is in the direction, that's considered the null. They actually use this. They used to use this in uh, aviation direction finding. Uh, World War II, you see planes with a little loop right above the cockpit, and that was exactly what that was used for, direction finding. In fact, they they actually, you know, turned that thing on a swivel, and uh, it helped them locate. So I have this in our toolkit. It, it It's very handy if it's a, a cleverly hidden uh, fox. I've got a separate YouTube video about how this thing works, and uh, I've got a link to it in the presentation. The next skill um, that you need, and it can be assisted by a device called an attenuator. When you get close to the fox, the signal will be so strong that it'll just overload your radio. And so you really need to knock down the signal strength. And there's a couple ways you can do that. The uh, 
easiest and cheapest way to do that is body blocking. If you hold that radio close to your body and put your body between you and where you think that signal is, you'll 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 block the signal. Um, if you turn in the direction uh, away from the you know strength of the signal or move the radio away from your body, you might start to pick it up, and you can use that to lessen the strength of the signal. This is why. Oftentimes, I'll tell people that are working public service events, you know, your radio may not be as effective if it's clipped onto your belt and your, you know, your back is to the radio transmitter. You, you, you know, and I know public safety radio. I'm all the time telling my friends in public safety, if you can get that antenna up, you're going to have better luck with it. Um, a couple other forms of attenuation. A, uh, a passive resistor based, and, and some people have this, you can put it on your radio and uh, turn a knob or flip some switches, and they're just basically resistors that, that knock down. Uh, you know, that's what an attenuator does in a lot of radio devices. And then there's a kind of an advanced one called an active or frequency offset attenuator that uh, actually you turn your radio off frequency, and then you turn the knob on this, and it slowly turns it back on. The advantage of that is a lot of times the signal can get in through the body of your radio. So the takeaway here, a lot of different options here. Uh, body blocking is probably the simplest way to attenuate the signal. And here's a link for those of you that are technical. This is how the frequency offset attenuator works. And this is a clickable link. When you get a copy of this, you can click on it and, and I demonstrate how one of these works. I'm not going to go into uh, this one. We can probably spend an hour talking about what this is, how it works, and how to use it. We'll, we'll skip that. All right. So we've established what? That this is fun. It's useful. There's four primary pieces of equipment needed. And at the end of the day, all you're doing is you're trying to find a hidden radio transmitter. Here are the three steps involved in finding that radio transmitter. The first step is you got to find the signal. You're not going to have a lot of luck if you can't at least find the signal. And so personally, and I've got a separate slide about some tips, I like to start on high ground and make sure that I can at least hear the fox. If you're down in a hole, you may actually be close to it and not know it because you can't hear it. So oftentimes there'll be instructions. Sometimes there's a group start. Sometimes it, you're, you're told, hey, get on the local repeater and, you know, uh, they'll give out the frequency and start from wherever you're at. And I always make sure if that's the kind of fox hunt it is, I... I will go stand in high ground. Now that picture up at the top, that's Mary Catherine. That is one of the highest points in Fayette County. Um, it's a uh, intersection of Georgia 54 and Veterans Parkway and Lester Road. It's just under a thousand feet elevation. Most of our county is 850 to 900 feet. It's near our hospital. So from there, I can pretty much with that Yagi hear any VHF signal within the county. Now, if we were off the top of that hill, we would we would be less lucky. So the first step is you got to find the signal. You got to hear it. The next step, and we're going to talk about each of these steps in detail, is triangulate the signal. Now, I'm going to give you all a hint. It's a classic blunder. Don't go point your antenna, get a strong signal, and try to drive straight to it. And I'm going to talk about why that's a bad idea. Your best bet is to triangulate that source of that signal. And some of you that have been in the military like I have, uh, you, you know all about that if you've ever had to do any kind of land nav. And then when you get close to it, you need to attenuate the signal. So this was a fox hunt. Actually, Sam, who's on, on board uh, tonight, uh, he, he actually did this fox hunt. And uh, these are some pictures from that fox hunt that he did for us. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that particular event because we, we had a lot of fun with that. 
So let's focus in on, on, on step one then. First of all, if you know the area that it's going to be in, go ahead and study the map. Don't don't wait until the day of. If if you know it's going to be in a county, a city, or a park, get online and look at a map. Get familiar with it, and you'll you'll be ahead of the game. Uh, start from high ground. Like I said before, um, pay attention to the signal strength. Look for reflected signals. Most fox signals are VHF. Some of them are UHF. They can and will bounce off of metal. In fact, some of the more advanced fox hunts, people will bounce signals off of water towers and buildings and stuff to kind of throw you off. Plot the first bearing. In other words, wherever you think that strongest signal is, you, you want to draw a line on it. There are some apps I'm going to mention. You can do it on a map, but... Again, the goal is to find the general area that that signal is. Everybody still awake? Yeah, right. we're going. I see some head nods and thumbs up. Okay, good. So step two is to triangulate the source of that signal. And what we mean by triangulate is take multiple bearings so that you can narrow down where that's at. If you only take a single bearing, you, you don't know how far out it is. So you may go right by it. By triangulating, you know, two signals is better than one, but three is optimal. Take more if you want, but resist the temptation of just driving straight to it. Now I'm gonna tell you guys that, and I guarantee you, if you've never done a fox hunt, you're going to get there and somebody is just going to go straight to it. And they're probably not going to find it. So you want to take at least three bearings. In fact, what I normally do is I will purposely drive away from that signal in a different direction so that I can get a bearing from another angle. So you can kind of see there in the picture, up, up top, that's Mary Catherine taking a bearing. That's over in Carrollton. Uh, down in the bottom, that's just showing you what it looks like to triangulate. So each bearing is a direction toward where you think the signal is. And you see when you have three, you kind of narrow down the area that you think it might be in. Now, once you've narrowed it down and you're fairly sure it's near something. And a lot of times the person putting on the fox hunt will tell you, hey, this is public property. This is a park. Uh, they may tell you where it's not. It's not going to be on private property. It's not at a school. It's not in the middle of the road. Um, pay attention to those clues because, you know, we want us to have a safe event. But once you think you know where it's at, triangulating isn't going to help you. You need to switch to step three which is attenuating the signal. Now, here's an example. Some of you may have done this fox hunt. There was a fox hunt back in 2018 um, that the Stone Mountain Group put on. And man, that, that one was, was all over the place. You can see all the bearings that, that, that we took for there. Um, anybody on this call, on this Zoom, did you participate in that fox hunt? Okay. One of the lessons learned, I think, by the Alfred Memorial folks is typically you don't have a 50-watt fox. That was part of the problem. I mean, when even it, it, that signal was so strong, I mean, I had the antenna off my radio. I had it in a steel box, and I had it lay it on the floorboard of my car, and I was still getting a signal. So, uh, you know, typically you're going to find most foxes are five, no more than 10 watts. All right, this is the fox hunt that, that Sam put on for us, uh, KD4SHK. This one was a lot of fun. And what was funny about it is just by luck, one of our bearings right there, Jonathan, we were within about 100 yards of the fox, but we couldn't see it. So we actually drove away from the fox to take another bearing to confirm 
that it in fact was there. So that's the power of triangulation. We got some solid bearings. Um, this is some plots from it. It was located at Kiwanis Park in Fayette County, which is also fairly high ground. And bearing number three, we were right on top of it. As soon as Jonathan there took the Yagi off, we were getting a strong signal. We just didn't see it. In fact, Sam was off in the distance laughing at us. We later found out. He saw us, but we didn't see him or the fox. So we drove away from it, took another bearing to confirm our suspicions. Trust your equipment. Trust the bearings. So when you get close, it doesn't matter where you point that antenna. It's probably going to overload your radio, so you need to knock down the signal. So you can use your body. You can use a loop antenna or an attenuator to dampen the signal. That's a fox hunt that I put on. That was the winning team. We did an alien-themed fox hunt a couple years ago. That was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, these guys, uh, uh, Tom Kirkbride, K1 EOD, and some Boy Scouts found the fox. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But you, you need to remember that, that, okay, you've triangulated, you've gotten close. But in order to find it, you may need to knock the frequency off slightly. You may need to turn up the squelch, body block. There's all kinds of techniques to knock down the signal. And I've shown you some pictures of what some of the foxes look like. And you kind of want to use your common sense and an eye, too. Most foxes are not buried in the ground. They're not really camouflaged. When you find it, you'll know it. I have created several YouTubes, but two in particular that when you get a copy of this, you can click on the link. The first one is called Fox Hunting 101. It's kind of a companion video to this one. And you can click the link and I literally take you step by step through fox hunting triangulating, taking bearings, attenuating, and then I kind of summarize at the end. Now, for you advanced fox hunters, I created a separate Fox Hunting 102, which talks about nothing but different ways of attenuating the signal, because oftentimes that's the hardest part of a fox hunt, is when you get close to it and the signal seems to be coming from all directions. So here's some, some general tips. Fox hunting involves following clues. If you have somebody administering the fox hunt and they're giving you clues, pay attention to them and write them down. And oftentimes if, if folks are having trouble finding the fox, you know, they don't want you to be out there all day, they may give you a hint. Pay attention to your equipment, the signal strength, the, the terrain, visual clues. Know how to read your terrain. Know what's high ground. Know what's low ground. Be familiar with your equipment. Don't wait to mess with that attenuator on the day of the fox hunt. That's very common. I see that at public service events. Somebody shows up with a brand new radio. Doesn't even have the frequency in it. You know, go ahead and familiar, familiarize yourself with your equipment ahead of time. Uh, here's a pro tip. Um, does anybody know what 162.55 megahertz is the frequency of? Weather service, isn't it? Weather service. Bonus round. Where's that antenna located? Oh God, they're they're all over the place. There's one in Conyers. There's um Yeah, but the specifically the one six two five five antenna for Atlanta is Stone I have I have no idea. Stone Mountain. Ah. Okay. So pro tip. All right. You want to practice taking a bearing. Turn your radio to one six two point five five megahertz. It's always on twenty four by seven. And see if you can't plot the bearing to Stone Mountain, and then check your map and see how well you did. Now, you can do that really with, with radio, sta you know, radio stations and others, but you know, that's an easy one that almost every radio will pick up is to use that. Pro tip number two, now that you know where it's at and the signal strength, try to attenuate that signal. Try different techniques for knocking it down. It's a pretty powerful transmitter that covers most of Metro Atlanta. Pro tip number three, 
And again, I'm, I'm, you know, might as well be making a, a plug for Skywarn here. There are several different NOAA weather frequencies, and most people have coverage for more than one. It's just that one covers Metro Atlanta the, the best. But from here in Fayette County, I can pick up four different NOAA weather signals at different strengths. So try to plot the bearing to those. The one down in Thomaston, I get almost as strong as the one on Stone Mountain. Now keep this in mind that bearings are rarely more accurate than 20 degrees. So most Yagi antennas have about 15 degrees, you know, on either side of the direction. And that's true if you're working satellites, which is another fun thing I do. And that that was another option for this presentation. Um, love doing that too. Um, discard bearings that don't make sense. If you if you plot a bunch of uh, bearings or directions and then you get one that's kind of crazy out there, you're probably getting a reflection. VHF is mostly line of sight. And again, most foxes are VHF, but just be aware that you can get reflections and multipath signals. The last few hundred feet of a fox hunt are normally the hardest. And then, you know, use your eyes. This is why Mary Catherine and I make a good team. I normally plot the bearings, and she normally is the one who actually finds the fox. And don't blurt it out. I mean, go find it. Be discreet about it. Otherwise, you're going to get bombarded by everybody following you. Now, these are some advanced topics that we're not going to cover, but this, this is a, you know, besides the basic three steps, there's a lot that you can do with fox hunting, um, with Doppler systems, time delay of arrival of signals, radio orienteering, uh, attenuator, you know, circuits, you can build kits. Some resources that you might find helpful, kind of the fox hunting Bible. In fact, it, it came out in the 90s, and it's still the best book out there, and it's, I don't know, several reprints later. It's called Transmitter Hunting, and you can order it on Amazon. The homingin.com website kind of is like the, the mothership of fox hunting. Uh, Bionics makes a lot of different fox transmitters. Uh, two of my foxes are, are from Bionics. Aero antennas, besides making the satellite Yaggies, they make these loop antennas and, and attenuators and other things. Now, I have heard rumors that CQ Magazine may not be in print anymore. So um, I don't have any information on that, but it did have a fox hunting monthly column. And a little story about how we got on the cover. Some people have asked. When we did that alien-themed fox hunt, the guy who writes that column reached out to us and said, hey, I was doing some internet research. I want to mention that fox hunt you did. You know, would you guys consent to an interview? And I said, sure. And, you know... We talked to him about it and and then, you know, send me some pictures. Well, then I got a, a phone call a couple months later from the publisher. Hey, we, we saw the article about the fox hunting. We're going to run it, but we'd like to put you on the cover. Is that okay with you? And I'm like, sure, I've never been on the cover of a magazine. And so that's the story of how we were on the cover of the February 2020 magazine. And it was funny, he said, and I'll mail you some copies. It took him like six months to do it. Some of you may know David Brown up at HRO. David and I went to college together. David called me and said, hey, Joe, I see you're on the cover of the magazine. I said, yeah. He said, I'll save a few copies for you. So he did. And I went up there and got them. But that was a, that was a cool thing. And that's, that's the story behind the, uh, the cover there. Um, this is some just stuff about, you know, who I am and things I'm involved in. What I'd like to do now, though, is uh, take your questions. We went through that pretty quickly. Well, I have one question. 
uh, while you were doing the presentation, I went over to the Bionics website on the yeah. on the other side of my thing here. They have several different kinds of foxes. Uh, you're talking about doing something countywide. Uh, say you, you take a 50 watt transmitter or less as a fox, correct? No, I say you you can do it with a five watt fox. Uh, you don't want a 50 watt fox because what's going to happen is now. You can decrease the power of it, but it's just kind of generally accepted practice for most foxes. If if you do it right, you know, now Fulton County is a big county. You may not cover the whole county with a five watt fox. And I submit to you that you may want to limit the area. So for example, you may say it's a five watt fox, it's inside the perimeter. There are places that you can put that fox that five watts can be heard most places inside the perimeter. I can think of five right now. And Just again, somewhere high. Time, You'd want to yeah, get some, somewhere high, right. Somewhere high. Now, it depends on who your target audience is. I generally recommend that you aim for the beginners and not the advanced folks. You can do multiple things, maybe have an easy one and a hard one. When you're putting on a fox hunt, unless you know you're dealing with an experienced group, you want people to walk away with a feeling of satisfaction that they accomplished something. If you make it so hard that nobody can find it, nobody enjoys that. So what you might do, we had one two years ago that we had an easy one and we had a hard one. And the hard one, the guy had rigged up several different foxes all on the same frequency. Every 20 seconds, a different fox signal went out. Same frequency, but different tone. That's advanced. Most people got two out of the three. Very few people got all three of them. Hmm. And again, it just kind of confuses you. Did another fox hunt where somebody had it hooked up to a Yagi, pointed at a water tower. So everybody went and drove to the water tower. Now what? Well, now you're there. Think about it. Okay, maybe I need to shoot a back azimuth to it. So I would recommend, now sometimes you might maybe bump it up to 10 watts. And then as people are getting close, maybe maybe if it's the type of fox hunt where you, you know, you have a net control, who, you know, where where's everybody at? How's everybody doing? And I recommend that. You might say, okay, it appears people are getting closer. We're going to knock the power down. I do not recommend a 50-watt fox. Now, if you live out west, they have fox hunting groups where people drive across the desert and, you know, you're driving around in your car. I personally think for the Atlanta area, you know, you got two big choices. One is, hey, you know, you may need to drive to a location and then dismount. But we don't want people doing laps around 285 and getting, you know, lost or whatever. And the, and the second type of fox hunt, West Georgia does this a lot. It's in a park. Say, hey, we got a fox hunt hidden in Piedmont Park. Go find it. Piedmont Park's big. You're going to be around there. Chastain Park. That's a big park. I was thinking the club could actually do this because we, we do something outdoors just about every Sunday of the month, every second Sunday of the right. month. And I'm sitting here looking at their products and I'm thinking exactly what you are. Maybe the initial one, which should be Piedmont Park or Brook Run Park or Triple Mill, one of the bigger parks right. is close to get to as a, as a warm up, and then maybe do something a little harder. But yeah. I, I like your idea. Yeah, you I, I definitely think having a, a fox hunt that uh, is accessible to beginners, you're going to find that more people enjoy it. Now, here's another thing that I've noticed about fox hunters. Most people, and, and I, I'm, this is not directed at anybody who might be on this call, but it's been my experience that most people overestimate their fox hunting abilities. Um, I sometimes privately smirk when somebody's acting foolish on a repeater. Oh, we're going to fox hunt and find you. And I'm privately thinking, no, they don't have anything to worry about. I've put on enough fox hunts. I know I watch people just do all kinds of crazy things. And I've been doing it for quite a while. And I'm the first to admit, you know, I'm not an expert. 
Uh, I learn something every time I do it. And I think, you know, it's that spirit of amateur radio where you're constantly learning. You know, that's a good, you know, frame of mind to be in that, you know, there's always going to be somebody out there that's, you know, maybe more knowledgeable. So, you know, shoot to have something accessible. And then maybe if you want to a more advanced Fox that, you know, one way to do it, maybe a VHF Fox for, for most people. And then maybe a small UHF Fox that's a little trickier. Maybe, you know, some other variables that you can adjust. Uh, you know, the length of time the signal's on, right? I normally like when I'm doing a Fox hunt for beginners, uh, you know, I let I let it transmit for 45 seconds and then let it cool off for 15 and come back on. Sometimes you'll do a fox hunt and it only comes on once every five minutes. Typically you do that on a driving fox hunt, right? Because you don't want people driving all over the road trying to hear the signal. Um, so those are some of the variables that you can adjust. Um, the power though, just be five watts is probably plenty, especially for a park. Okay. Yeah, the the spec sheet that I'm looking at on this one, I just realized on the third page, because I was listening to you, not reading, uh, all the power that they have listed here is in milliwatts, and the lowest one is seven seven milliwatts. So, yeah, I've I've got a, a, a hundred milliwatt baby fox that I'll sometimes use. I some of you have, you know that have seen me at Ham Fest, the, the the in 2022, the Huntsville Ham Fest, I hid the hit that baby fox that that 100 milliwatt one in the lobby of the uh, uh hotel there that the forums were in and uh uh encourage people to go find it i'd hit it behind a couch in the lobby area and that that was a lot of fun and that was plenty of power for 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 that um the fox that i have and i know several other people have this you know plugs into a bow thing and um you know, I turn it on five watts and let her rip. So, uh, yeah, it you know, a bunch of different ways you can do it. All right, just yeah, I've, I've, other people may have questions, but yeah, yeah, I've just I've just wondered about that, and then when, while you were talking, I looked at yeah, they're in milliwatts, not watts. Okay, thanks, Joe. Yeah, and some of them are controllers that get hooked up to to radios, and you know, it's really up to the radio, the you know, the power. Okay, uh, questions or even. You know, Sam, I hope you're going to promote your fox hunt coming up. Go ahead, Sam. Tell them about it. You just froze. There you go. You're muted, Sam. There we go. There okay. We go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sam, KD4SHK uh, from Coweta County. Um, I have, like Joe mentioned, I have hosted a couple of fox hunts over the last several years and have really enjoyed them. Um, the ones I have done, I have geared towards beginners, um, and kept them fairly simple. Um, fairly large scale though, I'll start out by saying we'll be in the Eastern half of Coweta County. Um, but my transmission, my initial transmissions, I'll put up, a an antenna up about 20 or 30 feet and I'll initially start transmitting at like 25 Watts. Um, and we'll coordinate over one of the local repeaters just to make sure everybody is hearing me and, um, you know, everybody's getting started on it. And then as the hunt progresses and I can tell, you know, everybody will report their location. Uh, I'll transmit about every 15 or 20 minutes to give folks time to set up, get a bearing and then drive to another location to get another bearing. Um, and as their search location begins collapsing on me i'll start lowering the power down uh to five watts on that you know still a you know 20 foot antenna and then as they're getting closer i'll leave i'll even switch over to just an ht on a rubber duck uh if everybody is within a half mile or so of me um but uh anyway uh, i do have a hunt coming up if anybody's interested in participating um saturday february 24th uh, here in Coweta County. Uh, don't have too many details planned out yet, but we're probably going to start about one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it'll either be eastern Coweta County or the downtown Noonan area. Again, I just haven't haven't picked out a good hiding spot yet. Um, 
if anybody's interested in, in joining us, you're more than welcome. Uh, you can either hunt individually or get uh, get a little team in your car, uh, whatever works best for you. Uh, we will be working on uh, coordinating everything on the, uh, we have a link for Peter system here in Coweta. Uh, you can get the information off the BGMRC website or, uh, or various other sources. But um, anyway, come join us again, starting about one o'clock Saturday, the 24th. What is um, that website that you just mentioned? Uh, BGMRC.org okay. is the, uh, the Noonan Ham Radio Club. Gotcha. So again, bgmrc.org. Got it. Um, any questions or Joe, did I skip over anything? No, quickly? and and what I'll do, Sam puts on some of the best fox hunts. I've enjoyed participating in his fox hunts. Um, he do, he's got a lot of different configurations of them, um, including the one that I, I I gave the you know example of, and you know sometimes we'll get on there, and 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 I've done them on mine too, where where you know, you just kind of, you joke with people almost, you're taunting them, but in a friendly way. Um, and, and oftentimes, sometimes it's taunting and then, you know, Hey, I'm not the Fox. You still got to go find it sort of thing, but I'll make sure when, when Sam solidifies the plans, Coweta is just one County over from where we're at, um, that that gets relayed to, uh, to you guys and vice versa. There's a lot of groups that are very active in fox hunting. Coweta is, we are, West Georgia. Uh, happy to come up and, and help put one on for Atlanta Radio Club. Uh, North Fulton does some. Uh, Gars puts them on occasionally. Uh, it's, it, it's a lot of fun, and it's cool when you get people from different clubs to, uh, to come out and visit. Yeah, if uh, Jeff, uh, KO4LEG, just do a Google on Bill Gramillion Memorial Radio Club or Noonan Radio Club. They recently rebranded. And Sam, I'm like you. I'm an old timer. I, I just remember the BGMRC. I don't remember the new name. I think I think the website comes up under both names. Yeah, uh, Bravo Golf, Mike, Romeo, Charlie. Somebody put BD. It's Bill Gramillion Memorial Radio Club. Bravo Golf. Anybody else got uh, questions, comments, or even pro tips that you have that we didn't cover. Yeah, Joe, can you give us the um, uh, place you can find the equipment again? Okay, so you're going to be emailed uh, from Rob the presentation, which which has uh, the resources in it that you can click. Um, at the end of the day, all you need is an HT. But if you want some of the fox hunting specific stuff, really the two biggest vendors uh, if you want to have a fox, in other words, you're transmitting, you're not, you're not finding uh, bionics, B-Y-O-N-I-C. Okay. Bionics, they make fox hunting controllers. Now, Arrow makes antennas and attenuators and other things on the receive side of it. Now, there are others, you can do a Google search and you know, on Fox Hunt transmitter and stuff and get stuff. But those are two of the bigger known vendors. HRO carries a limited stock of stuff from both of those uh, uh, manufacturers. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, one does, does the fox ID? Yes. Typically, uh, Rob, the uh, you know, if it's one of the automated ones, um, you can program it, and you it's a it's a Morse ID, and you know I've got mine programmed to use the club call sign down here, KK4GQ. Um, so you have to follow. If you're if you're transmitting on amateur radio frequencies, which that's kind of what we're talking about, um, you could do a fox hunt on GMRS if you had GMRS license. Uh, but if it's a fox where you're talking, um, you know you you have to ID. Just you know, yeah, you have to ID. I got a question. Yes. Um, how many dB? I've got an attenuator that's uh, up to 30 dB. Uh, what kind of dB range do you need to attenuate, do you suspect? 
30 is better than zero, but I've seen some attenuators go up to 100 dB. Okay. Um, and that's where, honestly, at that point, you may still get a signal coming in through the body of the radio, in which case a frequency offset attenuator is actually your best bet. Now, the poor man's version of that is just knock your radio a little bit off frequency, right? I mean, you know, take it a, a, a kilohertz or two off frequency, and that's going to, you know, turn your squelch up first, body block, and then maybe knock it off frequency a little bit. And that uh, fox hunting 102 video that I did actually demonstrates all of those. Yeah, this is the little attenuator I was talking about. Yeah. But it's SMA style instead, but it gives you yeah. a, a binary selection up to 30. Yeah, and that's and that's good. Um, the only issue mostly with that is that if the signal's strong enough, it it may come it, like if you got a plastic case for the HT, that signal may come in and bypass. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't matter what you put on the antenna port, right? I mean, it may yeah. overload it. And and typically that's when they're in my opinion, when it's a badly designed fox hunt. A badly designed fox hunt is one that's that's overpowering. And uh, a five watt fox probably won't mess with you know with your radio too much. But a fifty watt one, it, you know, if you're if you're within a half mile, you're going to be hard pressed to attenuate it. Period. Take some, take some aluminum foil. <laughs> I, man, I that that one in Stone Mountain, I put I put in a metal box, and I was still getting a signal. I mean, it was it was powerful. Okay, anything else, anybody? I know y'all got club business to talk about. Any other questions? Anybody at all? Yeah, yeah I got another one. The uh, I went on a fox hunt in Walton County, and my first one, first and last one, I guess. <laughs> and, but not just because of opportunity. The uh, What surprised me was, you know, I saw the people with the radios, and you're trying to direction find, so you're pointing in a direction to see how loud it is, and then you're turning a little bit you know, to try and zero in on it. But the Fox is only putting out like a beep every 20 seconds. And so you're not just, it's not a continuous thing that you could home in on it. It was a slow process. Yeah, I would, I, personal opinion here. And again, it, it's really up to the person putting on the hunt, what the rules are and how they do it. You know, I personally think a signal needs to at least be 15 seconds. I mean, you know, it, it's, if it's just a beep, um, that that that's kind of hard unless it's a beep that's very frequent, right? I mean, you got to have again. The, the the goal is unless it's supposed to be an impossible you know puzzle to crack. I, you know, I think it needs to at least have some length of signal so that you have an opportunity to lock in on it. I've uh, I've personally never heard of one that just beeps. Most of them, it's it's a little bit longer than a beep. Hey, but you find all it, kinds of different hunts. Is this the one, Rob, that was over at the church in that big field next to the church? Yes. Yeah, yeah. the one that you, that you came up to from Byron, yeah. Yeah, Joe, we had talked about that. Um, it was about a 120-acre field. It had some cover in the middle. Uh, the concern was that you'd be able to just walk out there and walk around and find them because the foxes were in PVC tubes about a foot long, and they right. were white. So they, they made it short, short, short on purpose to give people something to have to work with. Otherwise, you could just walk out there and found them. Yeah. So yeah. That... So, you know, it's a matter of, okay, so they got to work around the, you know, the fact that it's in this open field and stuff. So, you know, okay, maybe the beep wasn't long enough. Maybe it should have been five seconds instead of one second. But, you know, it you'll find that when you do enough of these and, you know, I, I think, I've put on some fox hunts that I think I've gotten some good feedback on. I put on one that only one person found, and I didn't think it was hard, but apparently it was. And I learned from that, and I actually, you know, changed the way I do it. And different, you know, again, know your audience if you're putting them on. Um, and and I know Sam knows what I'm talking about because I've learned some of this from him. Don't become predictable. If you're the guy doing the fox hunt, putting it on, do different types of hunts. Don't hide it in the same spot each time. Uh, you get to be, you know, get predictable. And so I, I'll give you guys an example. 
I am pretty active on APRS. So, you know, okay, I'm putting on a fox hunt. I know somebody is going to try to see if I left on the APRS beacon by accident. So I drove to the uh, local donut shop, which I enjoy donuts anyway, and I beaconed my way there, and I, I left that as my last beacon. <laughs> and sure enough, somebody said, got on the radio repeater and said, Joe, I, I think I know where you're at based on the APRS. And I said, go there and, and, and see. And I did that on purpose to throw them off. Or, you know, using a crossband repeat, somebody, okay, Sam's good at this. Um, you might get on the repeater and give instructions. Somebody might put the radio on reverse and use that as a separate way to get a signal. Well, that that's great if you're talking directly into the repeater. But what if you're going through a crossband repeat, UHF to VHF to the repeater? That'll throw people off. And so, uh, you know, there, there's little tricks to, to to throw people off. So just keep that in mind. If, you, if you're an APRS user, turn off your beacon or, or use it to deceive. Uh, don't let that be how somebody finds you. We we may reach out to you or Sam here later in the year to do this because I would like to do a simple one in a park before we do something that's more wide area just just to gauge the interest. No, I, I totally agree. I did one for the uh, uh, North Georgia GMRS group, which I'm a member of a couple years ago, and it was at Amicalola State Park, and we had three foxes. I had a baby fox hidden behind the visitor center, which they've torn down and built an all brand new one. If you've not been up to Amicalola in the last five months, get up there. They have an all new visitor center. But anyway, I hit a baby fox just to give her a practice near the Appalachian Trail arch, uh, the start of the approach trail. I hid a regular fox at the base of the waterfall. And then I hid one at the very top of the waterfall. And I told people, you can hike the whole thing or you can drive to it because you can drive to the base of the falls and you can take the loop road to the top. And it gave them three different foxes. Now, at all points, if you're familiar with the terrain of that park, you could hear all three. They were on different frequencies. But it, it you know, the one behind the visitor center was kind of the practice one. The one at the base of the falls was the easy one. And then the one at the top of the falls was a little bit harder. And uh, everybody found them, and it was a lot of fun. Some people climbed the stairs to the top. Uh, those of you that work the Georgia Death Race, you've been out there. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, other people drove to it, and it was a lot of fun. So, yeah, I think putting it in a park, Bill, would be a, a good way to kind of kick this off. Well, we'll right. talk about it amongst ourselves and see what we can come up with. There you go. All right, I know we're going over time. Last call, questions, anything? One more. Yeah. Teams. Can you have teams where you, you, you and your partner or you st you're in two different places in the park and you, and you both get a bearing right then to the Fox and that should give you, or if you have three teams, especially, right, you get three bearings immediately. Most, you know, again, there are no formal rules to a Fox hunt um, unless it's a competitive amateur radio direction finding meet. Uh, it's up to the organizer, but 99% of the fox hunts that I've ever put on or been in not only allow for teams, but encourage teams. Um, and so uh, and so by all means, have a uh, have a team. It's more fun with teams. And, and, and like you saw in the slides, Mary Catherine and I, you know, we have fun as a husband wife team doing it. So, uh, yeah, teams are a, a good thing. About the only rule. And this is. Again, um, my personal opinion, when I put on a fox hunt, I normally ban the use of Doppler locators. My personal opinion is that kind of takes the sport out of it. Mm -hmm. um, a Doppler will literally tell you exactly where the fox is. Uh, two people in our club have them. And yeah, they, they, they work extremely effectively. I tell them, use the Doppler when we're trying to find the jammer. But, you know, for the competitive fox hunt. Now, there is a way to defeat Doppler. 
That fox hunt I told you where we had three foxes on the same frequency. The Doppler had no idea what to do with that. It jumped all over the place. So there are ways to defeat Doppler, but my personal opinion, and some people say, no, you know, I think I should be able to use it. it just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? If it's a, a land nav course, you know, and we want you to use a map and compass, learn how to use that. I mean, GPS just takes you right to it. So anyway, off my soapbox. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Joe. And we, we may be in touch with you. Holler, I'm not later. going anywhere. We'd love to come do a fox hunt with you. All right, guys. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe. We'll see you back on maybe on satellites <laughs> later in the year. Thanks. All right, guys. That's a good pre uh, presentation. It's one of the things that we've been sort of talking about. It's trying to get some more activities. And if you all look at the second Sunday thing that we posted on the website, there are a couple of blank spots in there for later in the year, which this may be the thing to do. Uh, I, I was looking at the website while he was talking, the B-I-O-N-I-C-S Bionics, and they have they have a transmitter, a standalone transmitter, and they have a controller that you can put on an HT. Uh, both of them are reasonably priced, so that may be something we can look at for a little bit later in the year. We do have some short biz. Oh, one thing I was going to mention, and he took off. Um, I don't know if you looked at your calendar, but the 24th of February is also the day of the Dalton Ham Fest. So uh, it gives you a choice to make now. Either go to Dalton and buy something or go to uh, go to Noonan and play fox hunt. You can do either one, and I don't really care. I, I'm tempted to do the fox hunt because... Dalton's a pretty good drive. Um, we had one short piece of business, but let me go to Ed first before we go anywhere else. And we'll we'll go to Ed, and then we'll go to John, and then finally uh, Val at the end. Ed, do you have any any treasurer related news you want to share, or is everything cool? Well, we're still looking for the liability insurance or the umbrella policy for the Bank of America building. <clears throat> John has a lead for that. And uh, he's going to talk to a broker. Um, we do have liability insurance. The new policy started today with ARRL insurance. And I called the um, old insurance company. <clears throat> and she, you know, I said, is there a problem with having two policies for one month? Because our old policy doesn't expire until uh, March the 4th. <clears throat> and she gave me this list of things you got to do to cancel the policy and i i thought what well, if, well we just don't pay the premium well we've already paid it through march well so. what if it is what if we don't pay the premium for 2024 25 is that on her list of things we have to do to not have an insurance policy well they've canceled it there there is no premium that's the reason oh, we found okay. no insurance they canceled okay. our policy okay so just let it run out then yeah yeah and that's about it that's all, all right. i got all right that's good enough john you got anything you want to throw in no just to piggyback on ed uh i I've actually am waiting for the insurance broker to get back to me i'm hoping by tomorrow uh he's working on some options for us uh which may include up to uh, getting a new pol a new liability policy which will do an umbrella also the biggest problem appears to be getting an umbrella policy that's standalone yeah and uh, when he brought like i had mentioned in the board meeting when he brought it up he was talking uh, lloyd's of london so uh i told him i said well we're not averse to having to cancel the current policy that we just initiated to get a policy that does both liability and umbrella if it'll make a big difference so we're waiting on that hopefully hopefully tomorrow i'll hear something back from him on that uh oh. it's a fellow that uh that I got through a reference through the Dayton club. So All right, that's, that's good. Okay. So we we're covered. Um, I see Jeff's on the call, Jeff. The, the issue is that the club, the tower has decided they want an additional policy on top of the one we had. And then we found out that the one we had was going to cancel anyway. They're not offering it. So we've been scrambling to get insurance, which we have, and then this extra coverage, which they are demanding. So it's in works and it's best we can do at this point. Okay. Um, Ed, okay. Ed and John, you have gotten your stuff in. Val has been looking at another potential site for a repeater. He's going to give us a quick rundown on the potential site for a 
a remote receiver for the repeater. Go, Val. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were doing our normal Friday lunch, a new member, or I don't know he's actually a member now, but he just got his general, uh, invited Ed and I out to PDK. Uh, it seems him and some other guys have a have a rental arrangement at PDK where they they have uh, access to the old tower at PDK. And if you're familiar with the location uh, where we normally have our testing and we have our second Sunday operation, that building's basically in L shape. And at the corner where the L is, uh, is where the old tower is. You access it through a door there and you go up, what was it, Ed, two or three? I can't remember, two or three levels on uh, kind of a narrow stairway to get up there. But there's already some radio equipment up there on a level before you get to the top. And there's probably like three antennas up there. And uh, I think they would... Uh, from what he indicated, they would they would uh, entertain us putting our equipment in the tower and and uh, give us further reach uh, from the downtown location. Yeah, I wish I wish Stephen was on the call. I was kind of expecting to be here. Um, yeah, we used to have. We used to have a remote receiver on the two big water tanks over here on 85 near Jimmy Carter. And the the actual antenna was about 100 or so feet up the tower. The equipment was in the base. We found out after after a couple of years that the PA, the, the power amplifier on it had broken and it was only dumping out some something like 5 milliwatts or something. But even at 5 milliwatts, it was enough to hit the tower downtown. Mm -hmm and the through the corner of reflector yagi and it was enough for us to hit the tower downtown we've lost that water tower and then we lost sweat mountain so we're looking for any location north of town um i used to run the net from my house here from from the mobile that i use as a base i can't hit it i can hit 440 and i can hit dmr but i can't hit two meter so we we need a little better coverage out north and i know there's a couple people i've talked to so this this thing at the airport is not as far north as 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 we would like, but it also is close enough in where some of us can get to it. So there you go. Your your board is working for you, I think. Do we have any other business we want to throw in tonight? Now's your chance. Uh, Nothing at all. So let I, me oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Jeff. As I say, so um one of the things that I think would be beneficial as far as the DMR repeater is concerned is um, so programming managing the repeater requires connecting to it with USB, which can present challenges, especially if there's not a computer up there. But Motorola has what's called an IP repeater programming license entitlement. Um, I got pricing from Ken Bryant for it. It's, I mean, it's the same price no matter where you go. It's two seventy five, and it's a one time charge. So I don't know if that's something you want to consider, but that would make it possible to really program the repeater uh, and monitor it from anywhere. That's something we should look into. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, Jeff, offline, do you remember a long, long time ago when we first talked about, started talking about DMR, the deal I had worked out with, with Ken originally, uh, he wasn't just going to dump the equipment up there and then manage it. I wanted him to run some classes on how we manage it, uh, learn how to do the routing, learn how to do the equipment and so forth. Um, I, I can do that. I, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Same yeah. same deal because I didn't want him to just dump a bunch of equipment that only one person could run, and that would be him. And you've done a superb job with it over over the past couple of years. But I would like to learn more of the network and the technology. I always wanted to. I just never, I just never could peel the time off to do it. Yeah. Um, so if we do this IP this um, this IP thing, basically what we're talking about is a, a computer a computer type device hooked to the internet with a USB slot that plugs into the controller. So no, so it would replace the need for that. Um, so basically any Windows machine that you have anywhere with internet connection 
uh, VPN into the tower, which we have that ability today. Um, and then you use the Motorola software to connect directly to the repeater. I got, it. I got it. over okay. the network as opposed to USB. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay, I had I had it turned around backwards. Uh, all right, let's let's talk about two seventy five. That, that's the license. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, now it will require physical access to the repeater to install the license, but once it's installed, that that would be it. Okay, so I don't see any problem doing that, but we need to get the insurance situation yeah. settled before we even get to it. So let's just keep that keep that handy, and if the time comes, we'll pull the trigger on it and we'll do so, it. Yeah, I so like I actually it. have a little surprise there. So I actually had pinged Kevin Link uh, just to ask him, is it like, you know, in lieu of us not having insurance, he goes out there pretty regularly, and I asked him if he would be willing to go connect the USB cable to the Raspberry Pi up there, and he said yes. <laughs> it's nice to have friends. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. We'll we'll get, we'll we'll give you a yes or no answer before this weekend's out. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. The board the board does have to vote on that. Of course. Okay. Uh, just uh, a quick question. Sure. Uh, on the license, is uh, if you have a computer die, is it transferable to another? How easy is it to transfer? The, the license is actually installed on the repeater itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Motorola has a, a way of doing things, Lynn, which I suspect dates back into the 1930s, which they haven't changed. And if you want to have a real fun day, go try to buy a piece of programming software from them and watch what happens. I, I chased, I got a DMR, I got a, I got a couple of Motorola 5550s here, and I wanted to get the programming software. And I could never find anybody who could tell me, even with a product number, how to buy it. So you actually don't need to buy it anymore. They made it free like a month after I paid to renew my subscription. I, I know. And I found that I, out. I, ch I chased I, it around and I talked to Ken and he said, look, you made a good faith. He gave me a copy and he said, you made a good faith effort. I, I know you're a good guy. You're not going to steal software. Just go ahead and use it. And then I saw the next week. Yeah, exactly. They, they made it free, which yeah. I'm just, I'm still just using the copy that Ken gave me. All right. Any other business? And we'll shut this down for, for now. Just real quick, uh, Stephen has a uh, choir on uh, Thursday nights. That's why we don't see him. Um, I did mention what Val was talking about, and uh, I suggested that he needs to put together a repeater committee meeting so that to, he can be involved in all this. I agree. Um, so he'll do that. And then second of all, uh, for those of you that are online still, uh, Ben KQ4KIS, he's a I don't know, junior, senior at Shambly High School. He has a radio club that he started there, but he also runs, he's, he's been given permission to run the uh, ARC Atlanta, A. am sorry, the Atlanta Aries practice net. Uh, and he's doing so on Wednesday night, 730 on the 146.820 repeater, which is also accessible via, via uh, Echo Link. So I encourage y'all to get on, even if you really don't want to get fully involved in Aries, maybe, on Wednesday nights, if you're not sitting around doing anything with anything to do, hop on there at 730 and at least check in and kind of support uh, what he's doing at his age. It's 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 impressive to see uh, uh, youngsters like that taking an initiative and and uh, he's learning every 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 week. He learns something new, how to do something a little better, but it's always nice to have more than a few check in. So I encourage you all to join us on Wednesday nights at 730 on the 682 machine and at well, Rob, can we get that on the website? It's uh well, it's on the under the Aries part of the website, but it could be listed somewhere on the front page, I guess. Yeah, like yeah, on the front get, page. Get on All right. Rob is our unofficial official webmaster. He knows everything about web related stuff as an expert should. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, yeah I I wish I wish we okay, that's it. Seven thirty Wednesday. I will be checking into this net even if oh even if I have to drive into town to do it. That's good. Actually, I was on it last night. John, oh. I heard you guys. I just didn't check in. I'll start checking in. Yeah, like I said, Echo Link, it's it's up if you have to use Echo Link to get in. That's how that's how I get in and that's how that's I, I, I mean honestly, that's how Ben's been checking in because his radio is apparently not uh working out well enough for him to use uh the regular radio. So 
Well, I'm so line of sight to the Bank of America Tower. I have no problem hitting the repeater from here, even with right. five watts. We'll yeah, check in. I, yep. Yeah, man. Yeah, I spoke too soon. Wednesday, I'll be in uh, in Florida. So, well, Echo Link, I can check in. Echo Florida, Link, that's right. Yeah. All right, they'll give me my first. I haven't used Echo Link in 15 years. It'll be my first. Cra and I know I've got it installed on something here, probably the laptop. Yeah. There, there's a little bit of a delay, but you get used to it really quickly. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. There's always a little bit of a delay. All Echo right, guys. Link, Echo Link works pretty well. It's surprising. Uh, I would At one time, I would have sworn that you couldn't run a net on Echo Link. Uh, and then uh, Stephen and John uh, started running the net over Echo Link. And so uh, uh, when I was having r r radio trouble, I switched over and I use Echo Link now. And it it works pretty well. The only problem is you have to, when you're in transmit mode on Echo Link, you can't hear any RF going, you know, transmission. So there's well, a potential for doubling. Yeah, that but, makes sense. But it actually works surprisingly well. And uh, but by the way, I am uh, we're just about out of schedule, uh, the current schedule for NetOps. So I'm working on a new schedule, and we have a potential for three new NetOps. That's good. And uh, so we could maybe spread it out a little bit further uh, so people don't have to have uh, uh, quite as much uh quite as often that should help a little bit how many uh do you think we'll have it with, with those three uh i read you know, them i don't ha i don't know right off uh yeah, it's a good number i just probably close to 10 yeah I, I was lucky to have five and it was it was a struggle to keep five and, and then of course once rob came on and made it look fun we had a we had a surplus there for a while it comes and goes the aid you've done a good job with it yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, you know, one uh, EHM, Michael K. George, says he wants to be one. And there's a, a new ham that, uh, uh, or a new member whose name I can't remember right now, wants to, uh, says he wants to be one. And uh, Boy, Marie, is, he a, is he a new ham or a new member? A new member. Okay, yeah, that's fine. A new ham, I'd be a little careful yeah about. but new a new member yeah throw him in there give him give him a title it's like professional and, wrestling make him a title and marie in uh fayetteville you know was uh she actually uh uh had volunteered some years a couple of years ago but couldn't hit the repeater yeah and that's uh, she solved that problem and so uh anyway with luck we'll have uh Schedule them up, dude. Yep. Hey, if, if you guys want to support another young group, the uh, Georgia Tech group is having their net right now. Oh. W4AQL. So do we want to bail off and I'll run to Georgia Tech? I can probably hit it from the house. I don't know where their I don't know where their tower is, where their antenna is, but I can get. I don't know Georgia. where it is either, but I get I get a better signal from them than I do higher repeater. I, I, I could I could hit it mobile halfway to Griffin. I could get halfway to Griffin and still be hitting that thing mobile solid. It All right, used guys. to be used to be on top of the electrical engineering building uh, at Tech. Uh, there must be a lot of good ground in there. I think it still is. Yeah, it's, it's, although it does get warm there in the summer. All right, let's pull the plug on it, dudes. This has been a good meeting. And and Rob, good job getting Joe. Uh, I yeah. I sent a, I sent yeah. a text to Arnold thinking that he might want to jump in because he and Joe are like I put my fingers up. You can't see it. They're they're like buddies, but it, Joe uh, Arnold didn't pop in. Oh, All right, guys. Remind them, yeah. Well, I'll I'll remind you that he missed it. All right, <laughs> lunch tomorrow and uh, Orlando Hamfest next weekend. So anybody's going to Orlando. I, oh, by the way, I'm going to mention one more time. Uh, I have a ticket that was supplied by one of our members who wants to remain unnamed, but his name is Ed. If anybody wants a ticket to Orlando, I got one. Ed, if you change your mind and want it back, I'll have it tomorrow in the car. And that's it. Peace I've over. got an extra one also. Ah, okay. So we got two ah. extra tickets. Yeah, we should ask Joe if he needed a ticket. That's a good idea. 
So he's probably presenting there, though. All right, that's <laughs> it. Meeting's over, guys. Get out of here. Go home. Go All right. 73. Right. Good evening. 73, guys. Good night.